The opinions expressed in this show are the views of the host and not necessarily that of WTRW, 94.3 The Talker, or the Bold Gold Media Group. The following presentation is brought to you by the host of the program who is solely responsible for its content. Good afternoon. Welcome to Make a Change. I'm your host, Terry Martin, along with my producer, Tom Jenkins. Good afternoon, Terry. Well, good afternoon, Tom. Today, I am so happy to have Melanie Madeira on our show because I met her recently. And when I did meet her, I was just instantly, totally inspired. She has that effect on people. (laughs) And Melanie, I thank you very much for coming to the show today. Well, thank you for having me. When I met Melanie and we just talked a few minutes, I knew that there was something very special about her. And, and I just heard about a few of her challenges. And today she's here to share them with us in hopes to make someone else's life easier. So I'm just going to begin with questioning, Melanie, about your, your personal background. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I mean, um, I'm 45. I, I'm never one to shy away from my age because I feel the older I get, the better life gets. And uh, so I've got six kids and they are 21 down to five. That last one was a shocker that came to us at the end there. And um, I have to say, if you don't mind me saying, you don't look much above the 21 mark yourself. So 45 <laughs> just seems impossible. Well, thank you. Well, thanks. That's thanks to Miss Claire all, I guess. Uh, <laughs> um, and, you know, I, my background is, you know, I grew up in a restaurant kitchen, you know, small business family. My dad taught us all how to cook, uh, you know, working in the back of his restaurant in the back mountain, Kasha's restaurant, if anybody remembers that from way back in the day. And uh, then we got into catering and um, my dad still has that place called the Highlands in Dallas. And it worked for my dad. Went to cut while I worked uh, worked for him while I went to college in Kutztown as I became a teacher. And I graduated from Kutztown. Taught for a year at five school districts as a substitute till I got married, and my husband said, "Oh, free labor!" <laughs> <laughs> so I went to work for my husband at his chiropractic office, and then we started having kids. And um, you know, so I stayed at home with my kids and became a homeschooling mom, and that's what I've been doing for the past 16 years. And wow. uh, up until now, and this was the first year our three younger kids are in Abington Christian Academy. And uh, while I've, you know, been on and off, employ- you know, tech- you know employed uh, at several different companies over the past three years, you know, the economy has affected many people. So um, I'm actually right now working for a company called Live Mercury in Dallas. And what I do, we build websites and I write for the websites. I'm a content writer. Well, you're very ambitious. And that's one of the things that impressed me the most, because having five children myself, and getting mm-hmm. out there, and I hear your ambitions, and I, I just think that's such a positive motivator to help the women know that you can go out and do more, and I see your spunk. Well, so, I think that comes from, you know, what I learned from, I was just talking to my dad yesterday because it was his birthday, and I said, you know, I never imagined, you know, as I started, because I am running for office as well, I'm running for a state rep, which is, you know, we're not really here to talk about that, but it's you know, what my dad taught us growing up that you work hard and, you know, things come because you work hard and that's the way you get ahead is work. And uh, now that I'm running for office, I tell a lot of stories from, you know, my background, from my childhood. And people say, you know what, I, that's exactly the way I was raised. And, and it's resonating with people because people, that's part of our American experience. That's part of what makes us unique as Americans. It's a very, it is, I know it sounds normal to us, but around the world, this is a very unique uh, take on life that you know you teach your kids to work and then you grow up and you work hard and 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 then you can enjoy what you have. Um, I was just talking to a guy the other day and he said he was apologizing for belonging to the golf club and I said, well, why are you apologizing for that? And he said, is that funny that we've gotten to this place where you worked hard to succeed and it's okay to enjoy it. Yes, and that's how I I feel. You know, when you, you're talking about. Um, overcoming. That's really what I wanted to talk about today, you know, from the aspect of um, being on your show is that, um, you know, as a mom, it's you do so many things. You've got five kids. You know that you are busy constantly. 
and and that they motivate me. They motivate me because I want to be a good example to my kids of what not just what a woman can do, because anybody who knows me knows I'm no feminist, but I like femininity. And I think real femininity is about being strong and being soft at the same time. You know how to cry with your kids. You know how to buck them up when they need bucking up. And, And it takes that weird paradox to be a real woman and to be have that I call it iron willed femininity and that's what makes a woman strong and that's what I want to model for my kids that you can go for anything in your life some things we succeed at some things we don't we achieve things and some things we we just try to get there and and we don't get there but you know when you when you strike up against things in your life that come your way like I dealt with a very long illness in my life We'll never know, you know, what it was uh, exactly. Is that what happened in 2003? It is. Yeah, in 2003, I had a miscarriage, and um, I lost half of my blood because of the miscarriage, and I was rushed to the hospital, and I was not given a transfusion when I should have been. Oh. Uh, they sent me home, and um, I became very sick after that. And we thought we did go to, you know, there's not, there's just a big blur in my life over that time because I I was just very spacey through, it was just several months of almost a blackout of memory. And, but we went to a doctor and he said, well, we think you just had brain damage from miscarriage and not getting a transfusion. And so, you know, more months went on. I got pregnant with our fifth child and uh, I was just a very long a pregnancy of sickness, not pregnancy sickness, but just sickness. Uh, and then Nikki was born, and then um, he was just an infant, and I woke up one morning and I couldn't move my body. And um, I was telling myself to wake up and get up, but nothing would respond. And what happened, just in a nutshell, what they think um, that I had childhood Lyme's disease, and with the miscarriage, the bacteria overwrought my immune system. Can you explain that? I don't understand that. Childhood? You mean you had Lyme's disease from the past and it was just dormant in your body? Yes. Well, not dormant. I basically was just managing it. Uh, Lyme's doctor said I had four of the characteristics they would look for now in a child with Lyme's because not everyone who gets bit by a tick and gets Lyme's disease exhibits a rash. Only 30% of uh, patients with Lyme's have the rash and so you can I've never even heard of yeah that. you can have limes and usually then it gets diagnosed as MS or you know some other autoimmune diseases because limes even though it's a bacteria because it, the bacteria hide in your body's healthy cells they bore down into like each bacteria will bore into a healthy cell inside your body so your body responds to the limes bacteria as an autoimmune disease and so that's why um, instead of it looking like a bacterial infection, it mimics autoimmune diseases and it gets often misdiagnosed. And so the, you know, they, the, I went to a neurologist and he said, Mel, it's no wonder you're not doing well because uh, your left brain is gone. You basically don't have your left brain anymore. Wow. Uh, I'm was, just amazed here. Yeah, there was uh, so much damage. It was if I'd had a stroke to my left brain. And so it was, you know, seven long years of rehabilitation. Um, I couldn't walk straight. I couldn't, uh, I would tell my kids, for instance, you know, put your laundry into the refrigerator. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, words don't connect. You, you ha- I had, you know, telegraphic speech. You know, sometimes if I'm very tired, I'll still do that where you speak in phrases because your brain can't think ahead. And well, so, how did they build you back up? I mean, did they have, have to end up giving you blood transfusions? No, they, no, because by that time, my body had, had built its blood back up, and so mm-hmm. I had it back. But by that time, the bacteria proliferated. If that is because at, cer- at a, after a certain point, you can't test for limes. The limes testing is very inaccurate. And so you can go through testing, but um, even limes patients who get tested, there's a very short window when it can be accurately tested if you have it or not. Um, because limes is a spirochete and it buries itself into your own healthy cells so it's very hard to um, hard to detect and so that's why Lyme doctors often go by symptoms uh, and not necessarily by the test and so um, you know this neurologist really saved my life he was quite eccentric I I admit but um, but he saved my life because he said look these are the things he mapped out a plan for me on how to rehabilitate my brain 
and uh, and it was very very hard work over the next several years. Really, it took about seven years. Um, Can you share some of those sure. eccentric ideas? Anything with, I had to do a lot of balancing exercises because I had to, you know, stimulate the left side of my brain. So I had to do a lot of stuff with the right side of my body, you know, because you have that cross, cross brain, cross body mm-hmm. kind of thing going on with your brain. And so, but I'm left-handed. So I would have to write with my right hand. Um, I had to relearn how to add and subtract my kids would do math. I would do math with them. Now, thankfully, by that time, I had older kids who were very good at math, so they would help the younger ones while we were homeschooling. And um, I would do math right along with my first graders because I didn't. I could not add two plus two in my head anymore. I still have a little difficulty with that. I carry a calculator, obviously my my phone, um, because I don't trust myself to do that. It's one of those the leftover things I deal with. Um, but you, yeah, I had to do really just re it's you just as if you break a bone and you have to rehabilitate the muscles around your bone. Once that's healed, you can do the same thing with your brain. And it's called, there's a great book called brain training, um, by a neuroscientist called Dr. Michelle McAlpin. And I used her book to rehabilitate my brain. Uh, I recommend that. And I actually use that book a lot um, when I'm teaching and helping with kids who have learning disabilities, um, and that was really the primary reason she wrote the book, but I used it because I knew the basic premises would help me as well. And so it was, um, you know, just, it was just hard work of just learning how, just focusing on just walking straight. That was, that was a great effort, just walking for 10 minutes and keeping a straight line. Um, I would do that, and then I would go and sleep for three hours because your brain is so tired just from doing that small activity. But I was, you know, when I, when I woke up that one day in bed and I couldn't move, I knew inside my heart that I was dying. And, and I was okay with that. I was very peaceful. I had, I had just overwhelming peace because I knew I was going to go to heaven. And yet there was this little baby laying next to me. Right. And because he has special needs, I knew he needed me more than any other person on the face of this earth. And I just could not leave him. Right. And so I just said to God, I said, you know, if you'll let me stay here, I will fight to live for Nikki because he needs his mama. And... And I just knew after a couple of days that I was staying, you know, and it was going to be a long, hard road back to health. But he was worth it. And my other kids were worth it. I wanted to live. I didn't just want to be alive. I wanted to live. And so over the course of the next few years of just rehabilitating my body, I realized, oh, geez, that wasn't enough. Because once you start down that road of being sick, everything about you is sick you start to think of yourself as a sick person. And I know that people who deal with, you know, um, you know, addictions, help people through addictions and things. It's that same kind of mindset where now you're over the addiction, you're over the illness and you have to then, you have to heal your mind after that too. And sometimes where, you know, where David was a chiropractor for 20 years. So he would see this with, patients who had chronic illnesses and then they would come to him and he would actually help some of them recover. It means, you know, some chronic illnesses you just don't recover from. You just learn to live with them. Um, but sometimes they, you know, the families would come and they say, she's doing so much better, but she still seems like the same person. That's what impressed me when I met you. And when we talked, you were saying that this illness that you had, and I had been very ill myself and No one ever put it to me the way that you did when you took your hand, you put it right at your neck in your office, you were Mm -hmm. standing there. And, and I said, I understand exactly what you're saying. Yeah. And, and that's one of the reasons too, that I said, you should be on my show because as I say, that's before I knew you were running for any type of Mm -hmm. uh, political campaigning or anything that you were doing. But right now it's time to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll take up from that point on. All right. You're listening to Make a Change on 94.3 FM, The Talker, with your host, Terry Martin, our guest, Melanie Madeira. Melanie Madeira, easy for me to say. And I'm Tom Jenkins. We'll be right back. Confidence. It's something we all search for. It's something we all strive for. When we're confident, we feel we can accomplish anything. Think about it. When you knew you looked good, you walked with your head held a little higher. 
Looking people in the eye was easy. You felt like you could tackle the world. The first step in finding that confidence is obviously how you look. And when you look good on the outside, you feel good on the inside. Get the confidence you need with Madeira Clinicals. They're a unique skincare company that specializes in complete skincare for women and men. From anti-aging to glycolic and even a special clinical line for sensitive skin, Madeira Clinicals gives you the confidence. Make that change. Look brand new. Feel brand new with Madeira Clinicals. Check out MadeiraClinicals.com. That's M-E-D-E-R-I Clinicals.com. Or call 866-646-3374. Take on the world with Madeira Clinicals. Welcome back to Make a Change on 94.3 FM, The Talker. I'm Terry Martin, your host, and Tom Jenkins, my producer. Before the break, we were talking with Melanie Madeira about overcoming after effects when you've had a sickness that you really thought you were going to die from, mm-hmm. yep. and that once mm-hmm. you recovered, there was still a part of you that didn't recover, and I never heard of this before, and I said, did someone explain this to you? Did you figure this out on your own? And you said that day you figured it out on your own. And when I said that, I would really like to have you on the show, not knowing, as I was saying earlier, about you running for any office. Mm -hmm. It made it all the more important, I thought, for you to be on this show so that people can see the kind of person that they should vote for, one who really cares, one who's working hard, that... Uh, if, if, if people really cared as much as you did about what's right for our country, well, that's who you are. And it is. That's why yeah. I think you're so it important. Is. Oh, well, thank you. You know, it's, um, I've spoken to a lot of people, only, not only when David was in practice, because I was also a massage therapist for many years. Um, for I, My specialty was um, injury rehab, you know, people after car accidents or an injury. And they have, you know, you have a lot of muscle tissue that needs rehabilitation. Um, and so I would deal with a lot of people who had been through traumatic things or been through illnesses, going through illnesses um, like fibromyalgia, and they need ongoing care. And one thing that really struck me as because I was doing that even as I was sick and a lot of times, you know, I mean, I was try to be super mom and not a lot of people did not know. I would say not a lot. Most people did not know how sick I was. I don't see how you kept up that sick with that many children and such responsibilities. Um, I, I, well, my kids really took up a lot of the household duties. My daughter was 11 when she started to cook all the meals in the house. Um, my daughter, Hannah. And, um, you know, for one thing, it was just really good because, you know, kids should learn how to cook and clean and take care of the house. But I really was, I didn't want people, you know, I'm a stubborn Italian, you know, (laughs) I didn't want people to think I was that sick. And for one thing, I didn't even know what was wrong with me. And so, you know, it's, it's one thing, and I hope people understand that it's one thing if you can say, well, I have cancer or I have something and people automatically understand. They understand how that you're really sick. But when you just say, I'm just really tired. I mean, it's you and people, you just have to keep saying that. Well, I don't know what's wrong with me. I just feel really tired. You, you end up thinking, well, people are going to think that I'm just lazy mm-hmm. or I'm faking it or, you know, whatever. And, and after a while, you might question yourself. And you question yourself. And so, you know, I, I started, you know, I was, I was helping these other women who were chronically sick and I was still sick and I was really hiding a lot of it. Um, and I just kept thinking, I know I'm getting better, but I don't feel like I'm getting better. And I started to realize that people who are chronically ill like, pretty much stay that way for the rest of their life, even though their body is well. And I, I didn't want to be like that because I have six kids that I wanted to, I wanted to be alive. I didn't just want to just go through every day doing the same thing and just hiding so much of it. And I realized... I I had thought of my come to think of myself as a sick person. Everything about me was sick. And I you know, a lot of people do that when they're going through chronic illness. It's you end up thinking of yourself as that disease. It just becomes part of you. Mm-hmm. And you have to once you start to get well, you have to make a a concerted effort to separate yourself from that disease. You are not that disease. But yet your mind in your mind you have taken that upon you. You have to you. recognize that 
That's yeah. the way you're thinking now. And so the hardest thing then is to think, you know, geez, I have already overcome the illness. Now I have to work on something else. Like, you know, what else? How can there be something else wrong about me? What do I have? To, what do I have to do more? Nobody else has to work as hard as I do just to stay alive or to do the laundry or to just go to work or to do whatever. I have to work harder at it than anybody else. And it's not fair. You said this doctor was eccentric. So what else was he having you work on that just seemed so... Well, I, I did. You this was just... Food? Yeah, I, yeah. Oh, I was on a very, very strict diet. I mean, I eat healthily anyway, um, but it was I had to be on a very, very strict healthy diet. A lot of um, veg, fr- fresh vegetables. Um, I ate a lot of miso soup. Um, miso is very healthy um, because you have to rehabilitate. I did. I had to rehabilitate neurons and um, nerves. I still have some nerve damage in my arms and legs. Right? I feel tingling all the time. Um, but it's much better than it used to be. And I lost, you know, more than half of my hair fell out. I wore a wig for three years. Um, you know, so to me, just having hair to style anymore, I get so excited when I, you know, that I have my own hair back. Um, you know, just simple things like that. And, you know, my eyebrows, my eyelashes, most of them fell out. And, you know, just. And here's a woman who wants to keep on giving. You know, but I mean, it's, to us. Yeah, well, but it's what it's. I feel so much joy because I did, I have overcome it. And not only the illness, but I I overcame what it tried to make me be. I'm not an illness. And if someone's listening and you are sick, you are not that illness. You are not that addiction. And yet you, you become that identity because it's all that you know. It's all that you come to know. And it's very hard to overcome that identity. So you physically got better. Yeah. But mentally, you were still defining yourself as that illness. Exactly. What did you do to get past the mental part of it? You have to change the way you think. How, did you, how did you do that? When I would wake up in the morning or when I'd say um, something like, um, well, for once, for instance, I know that I'm running for public office, but I, I had became terrified of being in public when I was sick because... I thought that everybody else thought of me as a sick person. And I thought of everybody thought of me as because I had kept my illness so private that people thought of me as just, you know, lazy or um, because it couldn't define what was wrong with me. Right. And I was terrified of speaking in public uh, because all I saw of myself was sickness. And so I had to force myself to go back out and I wasn't agoraphobic, but I was afraid of the perception of what people had of me. And so I, what I would, I would have to consciously just either go to a store or go to church or go to a meeting, business meeting, business function, and make myself talk to people face to face and look at them in the eye and, and think I am not in my head. I would think I am not that illness. I am not that person. And I, I had to just re-change my habits. I had to, um, that was probably the biggest part was just looking people in the eye and communicating people with face-to-face because I'd become so afraid of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and other things like at home of just saying, well, I'm just too sick today to get up and do the laundry. And when you have limes, it's, it, um, it affects your heart muscle. And so just cardiovascular stuff is very, very difficult to do. It just wipes you out. And I would just have to push myself and say, I am not as sick as I used to be. I am better. And I'm going to push myself to the next level. And I'm going to get up and I'm going to walk for 30 minutes. And I'm going to do it. And you'd come back and be exhausted. But you have to push yourself to the next level. You'd have to say, I am not. I am not. I am not. And then you'd have to say, I am I am, I am. You have to change in your mind. You have to force yourself to think completely different thoughts about everything. That you know when you're doing. I mean, I have to admit, sometimes it still comes back a little bit. Like when I'm doing. Just gonna ask you that. It does. You know, like especially when I'm doing um, helping one of the kids with their math. It's very difficult Mm -hmm. because I just can't do the numbers in my head anymore. Do you find that when when it does creep back up occasionally? 
today mm -hmm. that you can actually handle it a lot easier, a lot quicker, recognize oh, yeah. it better because of the education you gave yourself and because of all that hard work you did to this point. Absolutely. So it does get easier as time progresses. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And you just, and it, because it becomes a habit. You just like, um, you know, any kind of thinking becomes a habit to you, whether it's, you know, I'm no good or look, or like I'm the best, because <laughs> sometimes that can be just as destructive. <laughs> um, you have to change the way you're thinking in your head. It's, it's all about neurons and memory, and you actually have to change those neural pathways in your brain because they get to be just like you take some water and you run it down some fresh sand, it starts to make a rut in that sand. And every time you have that same thought, it makes makes that rut deeper and deeper and deeper. Memories and our thoughts are memories and that's how they respond. That's how they work in the brain. Those those neural pathways become deeper and deeper and deeper every time you think it, every time you do that action. And so you have to actually physically create new neural pathways in your brain. And it's that way overcoming an addiction, overcoming an illness, overcoming anything that you have learned from your past. What, what did you do? Did you read books? Did you listen to? Actually, I didn't read books. I could not read a book for five years. And, and that, was, you that was a killer from? to me because I'm an English teacher wow. and yeah. my passion is literature. I love Charles Dickens and um, I could not because in my brain, it was like I was brain stuttering when I couldn't read a, a magazine, a newspaper. It would take me 20 minutes to read one paragraph in a, in a newspaper because my brain would stutter. It would just get stuck on a phrase and I could not make my brain go to the next word. And it was exhausting. So for me to not be able to read A Tale of Two Cities, which is my all-time favorite book, um, it, it, was, it was so painful. And so the first, word, the first book I read, I remember after five years of going through this rehabilitation, I read Jane Eyre. And it took me, I think, three months to read it. But I worked my way through it, and it was my triumphant book. After I, it was after I read that book, I knew that I was better. I knew that I could conquer anything because it was something that I loved, and I was able to do it again. Um, I don't feel that way about math, actually. You know, yeah. it's okay. Uh, calculator is always there, but uh, to me, literature is beauty. It's it's the beauty of our language, and for me to wrap my mind around it again is is such a relief and makes me want to uh, just express the joy of overcoming. And that's why I just want to share that overcoming that illness, overcoming that addiction, it's not enough just to get your body well. Your brain, your mind has to come right along with it. And it's a different journey. It's a totally different journey than what your body went through. I yeah. also want to chime in here and, and just to throw a little bit more on your ego here, Mel. Not only does she love literature and reading, but she's a phenomenal writer. Oh, I mean, you. I have read a lot yeah. of things that she has written. She used to, to uh, I don't know, do you still still write for David's show? No, not uh, anymore. Okay. Well, she, she used to write a lot of blogs for that and uh, just uh, it's just amazing on how, how you make that transformation and just literally if you think about it in such a short time it is yeah I mean you're talking about the brain mm -hmm. and it's um, and that's what's astounding to people that they really you can rehabilitate the brain that much and they say yes science actually shows that even adults with Alzheimer's can rehabilitate a portion of their their memory their brain but it's all like I'm just going to repeat the name of that book it's called Brain Training by Dr. Michelle McAlpin it looks like Mac Alpine um, but it's McAlpin and she's from Texas and this book is phenomenal whether you're an adult with Alzheimer's or a parent of a child with special needs, this book is phenomenal because the brain affects so many different things from reading comprehension all the way to losing your, your memory, you know, complete memory loss or losing your bodily functions. You can reclaim, uh, and I'm not promising miracles here, but you can do a lot. I mean, because I, I am a walking miracle. I mean, I, I've seen it. I've done it. I've used this on, um, I don't want to say use this, but it's, you know, it's just... It's work. It's hard work. But our oldest son had dyslexia when he was learning to read. And um, I went through the brain training exercises with him for two years. He went from 75% um, backwards, writing backwards and mirrored to reading The Hobbit. You know, and, and that's how effective this is. And that's how exciting that, you know, I am just not a person to ever say to accept 
no as an answer or to accept that there's a limit. If there is a limit, then fine. You know, we have a child with special needs. There are limits we bump against, but we will bump, bump, bump against that roof as many times as it takes to see if we can break through it. I just don't accept status quo as as reality. And I, I didn't accept it for my kids and I didn't accept it for myself. And it's overcoming is hard work. Um, you know, overcoming physically is one thing, but then overcoming that mental aspect that is that is really the harder battle to deal with. We'll talk more about that. We're going to take another short break here. Um, and I do have one specific question I want to ask you when we come back. Mm-hmm. Uh, you are listening to Make a Change with your host, Terry Martin. I am Tom Jenkins on 94.3 FM, The Talker. We'll be right back. Confidence. It's something we all search for. It's something we all strive for. When we're confident, we feel we can accomplish anything. Think about it. When you knew you looked good, you walked with your head held a little higher. Looking people in the eye was easy. You felt like you could tackle the world. The first step in finding that confidence is obviously how you look. And when you look good on the outside, you feel good on the inside. Get the confidence you need with Madeira Clinicals. They're a unique skincare company that specializes in complete skincare for women and men. From anti-aging to glycolic and even a special clinical line for sensitive skin, Madeira Clinicals gives you the confidence Make that change. Look brand new. Feel brand new with Madari Clinicals. Check out MadariClinicals.com. That's M-E-D-E-R-I Clinicals.com. Or call 866-646-3374. Take on the world with Madari Clinicals. Welcome back to Make a Change on 94.3 FM, The Talker. I am Tom Jenkins, along with our host, Terry Martin. And our special guest today is Melanie Madeira. And it's uh, the show's more or less all about overcoming, making the change in your life, overcoming, getting through difficulties. And we just heard an amazing story about how Mel lost practically, well, did lose her yeah. entire left mm-hmm. side of her brain and, uh, and and charged it back up, retrained it, re- rebuilt it, if you will. Um and you you had said something that was and you keep coming back to this and, and I, I know why you're doing it because it is very very important you know you physically get better you're yeah. physically mm-hmm. okay the physical problem is gone but the mental problem the emotional problem and and might I say the spiritual problem yeah. is still mm-hmm. there uh, because it's what we have trained ourselves to do subconsciously automatically whatever yep. the case may mm-hmm. be now you you were working very hard uh, you, you're physically better, and now you're working hard mentally. You're you're trying to get out of that mental mm-hmm. roadblock, that yeah. that pit mm-hmm. that you dug yourself into. Again, mm-hmm. not on purpose. Yeah. We just do that to ourselves. Yep. You know, the self pity, the fear, the all of that stuff. Did you ever get to a point as you were working hard to just say, I can't, I, I can't do this anymore. I quit. I'm yeah. done. I'm done. Yep, absolutely. There were days that. I wish I had chosen the opposite. When you were laying in your bed that day. When I was laying day. in bed dying. I, and I knew I was dying. And, and honestly, I didn't even tell my husband how sick I was. Um, for one thing, I mean, you're just kind of, I was like in a, in a stupor, like, wow, this, am I real? I, I, mean, I just don't even understand what is going on. How can I just wake up and feel like I'm dying here? But in my heart, I just knew I was. And I, I just knew that I could just give up and just say okay I quit and I knew I was gonna die and there were days that I felt like I wish I had done that because the road to road back was so physically demanding you know like um, when I would do one sheet of math with my kids and we're just talking about like four plus two eight plus two I mean we're talking about very basic math here and it would take me an hour to work through one page of simple addition, and I would sleep for five hours after that. Mm-hmm. It's exhausting. And and then I have a, a small infant on top of that that we were doing so much therapy with. He needed, you know, he needed so much therapy care, and our kids just poured their lives into helping me and helping Nikki, and I felt guilty on top of it mm-hmm. because, and I think that was probably the worst, was that all this guilt, this mom guilt on top of everything else that I'm the one who's supposed to be taking care of my kids. They're not supposed to take care of me, and I'm supposed to take care of my baby. They're not supposed to take care of their little brother. I mean, you know, do, you know, some things, but not not raise him, and they were practically taking care of me 24 hours a day and Nikki. And I felt so guilty because of that. I wanted to do, I wanted to be there. And 
And I really had to work so much out with God, you know, through this. It's a, it's a physical, emotional, you know, mental and spiritual battle to overcome an illness. You have to deal with all three or you're not going to be a whole person when you're finished. So when you got to those parts where you just wanted to throw your hands in the air, lay down, close your eyes and not get up again. What did you do? I'd have a very good cry. <laughs> I'd have a very good cry. And then I would just talk to myself and say, you know, who are you? You don't give up. You don't ever give up. Get up on your feet. Plus God had a plan for you. Yeah. And, I, and I knew that. And I knew that in my heart. And that kept me going. My faith kept me going. And I figured if God still had me on this earth, there was a reason for it. And there were six very good reasons for me to keep being motivated. But, you know, it's really just going back to what my dad taught us. You don't ever give up and you can have a pity party for a little while out in your room. But you dry your eyes and you get back up on your feet and you go on and you don't look back. And I think that's the, the biggest thing that affected me in my thinking. Tom, you're asking me about, you know, how did you change that? I didn't look back. It's one thing to tell the story now, um, and I can tell the story with, you know, like, this. Is, there's so much joy in this story, and I love to tell that, but there was a point where if I told the story, it just brought back all the hardship. And, was, and It felt like you were going backwards yes, instead of forwards. Yeah, and, and I didn't want to do that, so I actually didn't want to tell the story for a long time because I felt it brought back all the misery of it. And I just would feel myself get pulled back. And I think for a part of it, you know, when you're overcoming illness, addiction, whatever, is that you have to just move forward and go forward and say, what am I going to create today? Not what am I going to relive today? That's good. That's really good. I like to create. I don't want to relive. But when you were recovering, I still have questions on that. So you couldn't read. But... If you're just there all the time, and at that point, everything just seems so dire. Yeah. Then what did you do to get some positive inspiration? Did did your minister come in and talk to you? Did you listen to CDs, sure. DVDs? I music. mean, what, there must have been something. Music. What would yeah. help someone Christian music. out there listening yeah. right now? Worship music. I would sing. Um, just listened. It was, it was soothing. Um, classical music. Um, you know, it depended on my mood. Sometimes I wanted something more upbeat, but it was music that soothed my soul and got me through. And a lot of prayer. A lot of prayer. You know, out in the lobby this morning before we came in here to the studio, I told you there was something that was really, I, I wanted to tell you that I was thinking about yes. because you are mm-hmm. such a positive person. So at home, I was listening to Bob Seeger. Like a rock. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I was thinking, oh, I should have Tom play a little bit of that. Because if you ever listen to those words, it's you start out and life just seems like everything's going to be easy. Everything is just Mm -hmm. going to be wonderful. And, you know, then those 20 years that he's talking about that he's living in, it pretty much took, I mean, this is the way I gather, it kind of took Mm -hmm. him down. But Mm -hmm. then he came back stronger than ever. Sounds like you. Yeah, I I would definitely say that I am. That's why I like saying I'm 45 and I'm so happy to be 45. I would never want to go back to 35 or 25 because I am such a different person now. There is no way that I could run for political office five years ago. I was just too much full of fear um, and learn. I would say learned fear, um, self-learned fear. And and now because of what I've gone through, in having a child with special needs too, boy, that just, you're either going to, you know, wallow in self-pity because of that, or you're just going to take life by the horns and just say, we are going to just enjoy life to the fullest because of this little guy that we have. And is all of these things just kind of came together in my life and, and have made me who I am. And, you know, when we were out in Pittsburgh, um, you know, we kind of went through the, you know, economic doldrums of the economy right now. And, and that's another story in itself. But, you know, as a stay at home mom, nobody I literally had employers roll their eyes at me when I would, you know, interview for a job like, oh, geez, what can you do? You've been a stay at home mom like like suddenly we lose all our brains when we stay home. <laughs> but but it's um, I ended up the only job I could get was cleaning bedrooms in a Holiday Inn Express. But you know what? I did it with joy and I did it with the best. And 
I loved that job because I loved the women I was working with and I eventually, you know, got up to the front desk. You're not afraid to do anything. And, and you just don't, you know what, if you always look at life like this is crap, you know, <laughs> you're, you're just going to think of everything as crap. And I'm sorry for using that word, but, you know, it just okay. is. Um, and but if you look at it and you say, you know what, if this is what I have to do right now, then I'm just going to find the most joy I can out of this and and enjoy it while I'm doing it. And that's what makes life full. And that's what brings you fullness and brings you joy and makes you want to create something for that day rather than reliving what brought you pain and 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 just depression and sadness. And I don't want to live like that. I want to I want to look for the next thing. I want to look and see what's ahead for me and create what is ahead for me and my kids because more than anything, I want my kids to learn this is how you experience life. You're no matter a what great happens. example. There's something, just sitting here listening to you, there's something that I try to drill into people's heads. <laughs> Not successfully, but I, I like how you keep saying that, you know, I don't want to go back. I don't want to relive but you remember mm -hmm. and and yeah. and what you do this I, I say this almost every show I think when you change the way you look at things the things you look at change and what you did Mel is that you took something that a lot of people would let them crip, let it cripple them mm. you took that and you used it as a learning experience and you twisted it and you looked at it differently as in oh poor me you looked at it as no go me I'm yeah. going to do this. And you learn yeah. from it. And one of the most important things that, that I, I, I talk to people about is don't don't stifle your past. That's right. Don't shove it in a yeah. shoebox, duct tape it closed and stick it in a safe somewhere. Mm -hmm. Use that to learn from your mistakes, learn what you did wrong, fix what you did to the best of your ability. But more importantly, use your experiences to help someone else. That's right. And are you doing that today? Uh, that's what I'm doing today. And it's a joy to do it. It really, and because now I can talk about it without those feelings creeping back in of, oh, geez, but what if it comes back? But what if, what if, what if? I don't live my life with what if anymore. I live my, my life with what can I? Well, Melanie, you know, I see you're a beautiful person inside and out. And my business being the makeup, skincare business, mm -hmm. Madari Clinicals. Mm -hmm. I have talked with so many women and they've been sick, they've gone through all these problems, but I see you, even on the outside, I'm so impressed. You're physically fit, you are absolutely beautiful, <laughs> all you have been through. Now, a lot of the people that I have worked with, they gave up mm -hmm. and some of them gave up forever. Yeah. So w you didn't give up, so what do you do that makes you look <laughs> like you are and not only in your mind, but you could never tell by looking at you <laughs> well, that you had any problem. Um, you know, it's, it's hard work and it's having something to motivate you. It's having a reason to work at something. You know, I, you know, I am a small person and I've had six kids, but I am not small when I'm pregnant. I am starving when I'm pregnant. <laughs> and so I gained 40 pounds six times. So do the math. That's a lot of weight. So, you know, so. But you lost it every time. But I Obviously, lost it every time. you worked at losing it because many people use that for an excuse yeah. and they say, no, you well, could. Yes, and my husband is the motivation. Now he never, he loves me no matter what, but I want my husband to have a fit wife and he was my motivation. And I don't want to be, you know, because when you're, look, I've been overweight six times. So I know what it's like to be out of breath when you're doing something and it's not fun. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, and I save that box of clothing. That's my motivation to get back into. And so I eat healthily. I noticed on your website, you recommend virgin coconut oil, which I eat and use yes. liberally on my skin. Great. Uh, works great under your eyes and for your hair. Um, and so, and it's, that is one of, you know, God's miracles of <laughs> foods on the on the planet um and so it's it's those kind of things but i also want, just want to keep up with my kids i want to have i want now that i am physically well again i want to enjoy my life with them and so i do push myself to exercise 
um, not crazy. I don't. But when you were so sick, though, and you couldn't, mm-hmm. you couldn't even stand up anymore, and there's so many things that you couldn't do. Mm-hmm. Did you wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I, I need to put this makeup on, I need to put these earrings in, I need to look good for my family? But you, there was a point you couldn't even do that. What was there? Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of days, you know, well, and, you know, when you're a mom of little kids, there's spaghetti sauce and applesauce and throw up in your hair, you know, whatever, you know, you're just... You become a walking tie-dye. You, you <laughs> so, you know, but there, there had to be time for you somewhere yes. along. You ha- of, but you see, that's the that key, time. is that you have to make that time. You have to say, you know what, kids, I'm exercising for 30 minutes here, go play, I'll put on Disney Channel, whatever, but this is, I because when you are taking care of yourself, you are taking care of everybody else. Because really, everybody else in the family depends on you, husband right. included, you know. And if you're not taking care of yourself, there's your whole family who you can't take care of. Right, and they won't be healthy either. That's right. Let's take one more quick break. When we come back, I want to find out a typical day in Melanie Madeira's life today. Oh, my. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a little, oh little prep there. I want you to think about that. Typical. Yeah. <laughs> You're listening to Make a exactly. Change on 94.3 FM, The Talker. We'll be right back. Confidence. It's something we all search for. It's something we all strive for. When we're confident, we feel we can accomplish anything. Think about it. When you knew you looked good, you walked with your head held a little higher. Looking people in the eye was easy. You felt like you could tackle the world. The first step in finding that confidence is obviously how you look. And when you look good on the outside, you feel good on the inside. Get the confidence you need with Madeira Clinicals. They're a unique skincare company that specializes in complete skincare for women and men. From anti-aging to glycolic and even a special clinical line for sensitive skin, Madeira Clinicals gives you the confidence. Make that change. Look brand new. Feel brand new with Madeira Clinicals. Check out MadeiraClinicals.com. That's M-E-D-E-R-I Clinicals.com. Or call 866-646-3374. Take on the world with Madeira Clinicals. Welcome back to Make a Change on 94.3 FM, The Talker. I am Tom Jenkins, along with your host, Terry Martin, and our special guest today, Melanie Madeira. It's uh, overcoming, more or less, today is the, mm-hmm. is the topic of the show. And uh, hopefully you, you heard the first three parts of this, because it's just, it's mind-blowing. And I mean, I've, I've known Melanie for a while when I, when I worked with, uh, with David here on, on The Talker. You know, you're, you're an awesome mom, an awesome wife, you, one of the strongest women I've ever met. What does a day look like for you today? Whew, that is a tough question because right now a day is I get up. Usually I wake up around five or five thirty. Uh, the adrenaline kicks in and I think, oh my gosh, I have so much to do today. <laughs> and and I check out my Facebook because I bring I do a lot of news sites on my Facebook page. So I I read you know the stuff that's coming out for the day um, in political news, national news, state news, and see if there's anything that I need to you know address to put up on my political page right away that you know I think is a really important story to put out. Um, but just so I'm also aware because I'm I'm a news junkie and I want to know what's going on. And start my day with the news and then. And of course, I listen to my husband every morning. From <laughs> six to nine. I was wondering on the way yes. in if you do. I do. I listen to my husband every day. Okay. I think I am. I know I am my husband's biggest fan. He is um, not only is he a great husband. Um, he really is. He's. I know a lot of people think this shtick of him being, you know, Mister Big Shot. And he's no, not. he loves he's, his family. I could tell that so, when he talked um, about you. He is so loving, and um, I. We had, you know, married 22 years and he is my best friend and um, we work well together. And I love listening to his show because I love what he says. I think he brings out great ideas, great points. And um, do we argue about stuff? Sure. I call, he'll come home and I say, why did you say it that way? That was dumb. <laughs> you, know, and you should have said it this way, you know, but we have a lot of fun together. And so I listen to it while we're getting David's show ready. I'm getting the kids up and we're getting breakfast together and I'm getting ready for work. And so, you know, we, we all listen to dad on the, on the radio and uh, while the kids are screaming around the house and running around and throwing stuff and, you know, eggs are spilling on the floor and, you know, we're, you know, mopping up sticky whatever that Nikki spilled or you know who knows but um, and then I, I work from home in the morning and then in the afternoons I am working on campaign stuff I am either going door to door knocking on as many doors as I can I've already been to 
Um, my total now is 3,000, I think we're at 3,471 doors knocked wow. on so far. And I will get to 10,000 by the end of October. Uh, I, we know statistically that that's the level at which you can affect polling before you even do media. But it's not just, you know, the doing it for winning sake. I'm doing it because people want to know that there's a candidate out there that will represent them. And are, am I going to represent everybody? No, because there are liberals in this district that I'm not going to represent and they're not going to vote for me. Um, and I've met them at their doors and we've had some, you know, pleasant conversations. I'm not a, you know, like argue at your door kind of person. I like debate. I like a good debate. Um, but, you know, but it, people want to know, is there, you know, they want to get a sense of who you are. And the only way they can do that before they vote for you is if they can say, you know what, I met her and you know, the thing I got in the mail about her doesn't seem like that can be possibly true because I met her and she seemed very genuine and, and nice. And I think more than ever before, people want to vote for somebody who's who is like them, who represents their life, not just their views, but represents their life. A lot of politicians are there right from a young age, right out of college, right out of at a young age. And what do they really know of life experience? Um and it's, I think it's really important that people who are creating laws for us have experienced life. You know, you can't fix things in Harrisburg if you have never had to fix something in your own life. And that brings a much different perspective to legislating and representing people than if you've never had to do that before. Why did you decide to do this? I am running for my kids. Six reasons, and they're the six kiddos at home. And you now my kids have seen me involved in politics, local politics, for many years behind the scenes, helping candidates get elect, you know, elected or not, but still helping them nonetheless, um, because I believe in those candidates. Um, they represent my values, and so. When the three younger kids were in school this year, um, my three older kids said, "Mom." We have seen you work so hard for other candidates. We know what you can do, and we know what you can do in Harrisburg because there's, you know, there's nobody like you, <laughs> and and we want you to run. So they are actually pooling their money together for me to run, and they're financially backing me with the household budget so that I can do this. I mean, it's an amazing thing that you pour as a mother, you pour your life into your kids, and then one day they just come back and they say, "Here you go, mom." You haven't even asked for this, but we're doing this for you because you've given us so much and we know what you can give to others. So we're going to make this possible for you. And they are the reasons why I'm running. Well, Melanie, what is important that you would like everyone to know? Okay, well, you know what? I'm going to tell you a quick story uh, because you just reminded me when you brought up, you know, what am I doing day to day and going door to door? And it was a blog that I just put up yesterday. And because what writing I'm doing now is for myself and for the for the website. How would people be able to get to read that? Oh, by the way. Oh, yes. It's Melanie4PA.com. That's M-E-L-A-N-I-E 4 f o r. PA.com. Or you can find me on Facebook, Melanie Madeira. I have two pages, my personal and my political. So it's just Melanie Madeira for my political. And this show will be on YouTube also. And awesome. Madeira Clinicals. Thank you. Com. And, um, you know, I was stopped at one door. And you can't, you know, when you stop at 3,471 houses, there occasionally is the the, the jerk that you're going to run into. <laughs> and, you know, and you know, look at somebody wants to say, oh, she said jerk on the air about somebody. Like, this guy was a total jerk, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I knocked on the door, did the 30-second intro. Hi, my name is Melanie Madeira. I'm walking around your neighborhood, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and so he said, all right. So he's looking at my card, and he's, you know, like, giving me the once-over, like, geez, okay. Um, so tell me, tell me your background. So I gave him the 30-second quick because you want this to be quick i mean you Elevator know you've got speech. 200 doors to get to in a day and you want it to be quick but you also want i always make sure i say do you have any questions you'd like to ask me while i'm here because people want to know that they're heard i want as a as a voter i want to know that i'm heard i want my representative to hear me and i want people to know i i am here that's what this job is it is to represent, it is to serve, it is to hear what you have to say and what you need. We're here for constituent services. Um, you know, that's part of the job. And so he said, yeah, well, give me your background. So I gave him a 30 second brief intro. I was a teacher before I got married, you know, helped my husband out with his chiropractic business. When we got married, started having kids. And then I became a homeschooling mom. And he said, he looked at me, he said, yeah, but did you work? Oh, <laughs> I was like, 
Okay. Oh. <laughs> if there is one question that makes my Italian blood boil, it is that question. <laughs> you know, and um, because anybody who is a homeschooling mother, stay at home mother, I don't know how any do mother it. at all knows that if you are home with your kids, you are working your little tail off mm-hmm. every day. You know, Every minute. <laughs> every minute of every day, 365. And it just, you know, I mean, I handled it graciously. I just said, well, you know, homeschooling moms do work every day. And he just said, oh, well, yeah, but I just want to know, did you have a job? <laughs> like, oh. okay, I think this conversation is over. And, um, you know, I just politely went on to the next house. But, you know, I wrote a blog about it because, you know, and I brought my style to it. I'm not one to say, oh, can you believe this jerk I ran into? And, you know, blah, blah, blah. No. I'm going to turn this into, I mean, Tom knows my style. I am the queen of snark. And I, although I am trying to rein that in a little bit through the election, um, anybody who knows me knows I love sarcasm. And I love to illustrate through sarcasm and point out how stupid something can be and make it funny and lighthearted. And so I wrote this blog about, you know, do homeschooling moms work? You know, and like they're fighting this misconception that, you know, or this cultural belief that stay at home moms eat bonbons all day when actually we enjoy the leftovers of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches much more, you know, and, you know, and things like that. Like, and, it, and it, you bring the point out, but in a funny way, and you can make a point, uh, but without being mean about it or retaliate, because when you start to get defensive, and this really goes for anything, whether you're running for office or just in your own life, when you have to, when you start defending yourself and you, you take offense at something and then you start defending yourself, you're the one who looks like you're the big meanie. You're the one who looks like you might have something to hide as a politician. And honestly, there's nothing to defend myself about choosing to be a homeschooling mom. I say, hey, go moms. You know, we take it on the chin every day financially because we sacrifice to stay home. We don't stay home because our husbands are rich. I mean, there may be a few, but you know, like we had one car for 10 years. We sacrificed because we thought this was the best way to educate our kids. And, you know, they take it on the chin financially and culturally because, you know, like those bosses who would look at me and roll their eyes like, wow, what can you know? And and we also take it on the chin physically. It is a physically demanding job. What other job is 24-7, 365 except motherhood? And staying at home, there is no break ever, you know. Um, and you know, and I have been a quote working mother, and I have been a stay-at-home homeschooling mother. And it is far harder to be a stay-at-home homeschooling mother by a long shot. And you know, I know there will be feminists who will take offense to that, but I've done both. I have done both. I have worked outside the home seven days a week in a row. I had a stretch of four months, seven days a week, no break, versus being a stay-at-home mom. I would take the seven days a week working at the hotel any day because there is just something about little people clawing at you for 24 hours a day that is just exhausting. You never get a break. <laughs> you know, you, you know, you don't. I need this. I need this. I need this. One more time. What's your webpage? Melanie4PA.com. But that post has now, this morning, oh, when I looked at it, it was almost at 2,000 views. You know, because it's very important. People are like, that is, first of all, they're saying, he did not say that. <laughs> well, yes, he did. Um, but it's because it strikes a chord because... I'm just like everybody else. And what the important thing to say in that is he wanted to say, well, how can a mother go to Harrisburg and and do it? And I say, that is the perfect place for a woman who has been a mother, because those are the things that we need in Harrisburg. A mother serves her family. A representative serves. That's what you're there for. A mother budgets a shoestring budget every day and balance and make sure it balances because that's what you have well what do we need in harrisburg we need people who are going to balance and thank god they passed a budget i'm so proud that this legislature passed a budget without raising taxes i think that is phenomenal in this economy that we're not going to see another tax and and so i'm, I'm very proud of that and but you know moms yes. are there because you become i call this the the greatest paradox iron willed femininity and that makes the perfect person to stand your ground. You have to stand your ground in a place like Harrisburg and Washington, D.C. and any other state capital in the country because there's so much fierce opposition to what you want. Or you have to be the fierce opposition to what someone else wants. And you have to know how to stand your ground 
firmly and kindly, sometimes not so kindly, but you have to know how to do that. And what better way than learning that iron-willed femininity of being a mother? Thank you so much for being on the show today. I have enjoyed it. Thank this you. This is fantastic. Very, very, it was great. On overcoming. And that is it for Make a Change on 94.3 FM The Talker. I'm Tom Jenkins along with your host, Terry Martin. Thanks again, Mel. Thank you. Have a great weekend.